um, yeah, congrats on the, mm -hmm. the uh, this new ministry. Mm -hmm. Must yeah, be exciting. It's been half a year. Yeah. You've been able to uh -huh. to create your own mm -hmm. portfolio. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's quite rare to have this entirely new ministry uh, yeah. in recent history. But uh, during the pandemic, uh, we worked already very closely with the four or five different uh, agency level units uh, for the counter pandemic work. Uh, so basically, we just look at who I interact the most and boom, instant ministry. Right? So there's already a mutual trust. Yeah. So how are you, uh, have you finalized mm -hmm. you know, the agenda for mm -hmm. the ministry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, uh, resilience for all uh, with the country pandemic, which is itself a form of resilience work, um, is the most important. So for this year, we're focused on communication resilience. Um, for example, when the submarine cables are cut, we want to make sure the video conferencing still work uh, with satellites and data centers and so on. Uh, so that's important. Uh, we also want the societal resilience in terms of counter disinformation and propaganda work. Uh, so working with professional journalists and civic journalists so that your work uh, can prosper uh, on the international largest platforms like Google and Facebook and so on. And for them to give the journalists sufficient resources. Uh, to do digital transformation. So that's uh, also very important societal resilience. Uh, and finally, uh, cybersecurity uh, resilience, uh, because we face unprecedented levels of denial of service, the cyber attacks. Uh, even before the model was founded last August, uh, there was this drill right, right after US House uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit. Uh, the peak in a single day, the denial of service, was 23 times the previous peak in wow. a single day. So huge volume. Uh, so we need to work on zero trust uh, network architecture on T road, which are the designs like the Estonian X road, uh, to make sure that the cyber attackers cannot gain an advantage. Yeah. Have those kind of attacks uh, has has that level been sustained since mm -hmm. then? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so millions a day. Right? Well, so so it's it's a real. Um, it's a real situation, uh, and uh, we're, we're quite literally in the front line. Um, and so, interestingly, uh, we've seen that uh, they sometimes don't ne even need to break into a network. They just needed to disrupt uh, website connectivity for a couple hours uh, while their propaganda machines are at work. So that when the journalist goes to fact check, oh, the website was not reachable. Uh, and that uh, creates the opportunity for the propaganda to uh, be viral. And where are the attacks coming from? Uh, sorry, I'm sorry? Where are the attacks <coughs> coming from? Uh, from abroad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From where? So uh, we know that it's not uh, within our domestic network and it traveled from the submarine cables, uh, but outside of which, of course, it's difficult to trace uh, its exact origin. But what it's trying to do, very simply put, is just to deny the normal service. Mm -hmm. So um, you visited Lithuania recently. Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell me about yeah. your uh, collaboration with, the, with Lithuania? Yeah, I'm a e-Lithuanian now. You know? Oh, really? Yeah, uh, oh. I, I got an e-residency. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and which uh, would allow me, for example, if I want uh, to to open a bank account, uh, to start a company, not that I can start companies while being a minister, <laughs> but theoretically, it would facilitate document signing, uh, digital signatures, and so on with the European EIDAS uh, framework. Uh, and so I think this is really important that we have these people-to-people -people ties, uh, because uh, in addition, of course, to the semiconductor exchanges and things like which is very important economically, we also want to make sure that uh, we share the same playbook when it comes to counter disinformation and counter propaganda. Lithuania, like Taiwan, uh, really believes in journalistic freedom of expression, uh, of the freedom of peaceful assembly and association online and so on. So we do not counter propaganda by being, you know, a draconian state uh, with a takedown, shutdown and so on, uh, which means that we need to develop antibodies of the mind uh, that warns people against incoming, emerging threats uh, like interactive defects that can clone my voice, uh, clone your image, uh, right? Uh, and so uh, these educational materials, situational awareness materials uh, is very much needed on both sides uh, for pedagogical purposes. Uh, and so we signed a letter of intent sharing such materials uh, to raise awareness of cybersecurity on both sides. Um, 
uh, and the bodies of the mind is a, is a great uh, mm -hmm. expression. What, what are the, could you give me some specifics mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, definitely. So we discovered that it is not the uh, fact check results, but the act of going through fact checking, like thinking like a journalist, like what are the sources, are they balanced, what's the frame, and, and so on, uh, that inoculates the mind so that one would not buy into uh, the outrage, the sensationalism uh, of the day, but rather will think twice uh, before actually reporting uh, that. And this is the core of journalism training. Uh, so to me, um, journalism to the disinformation crisis is just like uh, epidemiology expertise when it comes to the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? So uh, in Taiwan, uh, we also help, for example, there's a school in Lviv that we helped uh, to reinstall the more modernized um, computers, laptops, uh, educational networks, and so on, uh, to ensure that they can actually uh, build strength, um, like a digital resilience of the mind by connecting to the global democracy network to share uh, what's actually happening there, right? Because uh, we've seen during the Ukrainian um, situation, the Russia's aggressive uh, and provoked war against uh, Ukraine, uh, it is the everyday people sharing their accounts and of course Zelensky's daily addresses, uh, that set the records straight uh, instead of the Russian defects or propaganda or things like that. People want to pay attention to what's actually happening there. But for that to happen, they need to have, um, I don't know, um, energy, right? power, uh, electricity, that is to say, and also uh, laptops and uh, internet connectivity. Um, so, so with Ukraine and the Baltic states, you know, they're mm -hmm. throughout this coming from Russia. Mm -hmm. um, with, with Taiwan, you have a different mm -hmm. scenario, right? Mm -hmm. um, how, is, how is Chinese cyber attacks mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. from Russia's cyber attacks, for mm -hmm. example? What is, how is the, sort of, um, mm -hmm. the threat uh, mm -hmm. level different? Yeah, so um, I think a lot of the um, disinformation or propaganda is not pro something or against something. Uh, what they're doing is essentially amplifying the uh, extremes, the polarization already in our society. So I would say it's opportunistic more than anything. Like whenever there is, for example, a preference, a strong preference of certain vaccines or against certain vaccines, uh, that vector is something that gets amplified. Um, and uh, in Taiwan, we were quite successful to turn such uh, polarization um, mentality into something like a friendly competition. So in Taiwan, people competed, I guess, between uh, four different vaccine brands. Like my, the vaccine I got is better than yours, right? <laughs> but, but not vax, anti-vax. Uh, and so uh, by working with a plurality of choices and uh, making sure that freedom of expression is on the uh, competition of benefits and benefits instead of benefits and conspiracy theories, uh, we countered that sort of propaganda and disinformation. So while I uh, am not uh, an expert in Russian uh, disinformation and cyber attack, but I would say that the thing that we're facing now is mostly opportunistic. Yeah. How coordinated uh, do mm -hmm. you think Russian and China mm -hmm. uh, cyber attacks and, and mm -hmm. disinformation is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, these two were not very connected. Uh, coordinated prior to last year. Uh, last year during, as I mentioned, the U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit and afterwards, that's uh, one of the first uh, clear coordination that we have witnessed. So a cyber attack that uh, disrupts the website traffic for a couple of hours. At the same time, another cyber attack uh, that posts some hate uh, visual or speech uh, on the uh, advertisement billboard outside of the Taiwan Real Station and many other places. Uh, and while that was <clears throat> quickly fixed, um, the journalists who want to check the official website found that it cannot be connected. Uh, and so that amplifies this narrative of the Taiwan Real Station has been taken over, uh, or the presidential office, the Ministry of National Defense, the MOFA, Foreign Affairs, have been taken over. Uh, and so there's a clear sign of coordination. and. Nowadays, uh, I think these two are even more uh, closely connected uh, because uh, a, a part of sowing this court is this kind of cultural sensitivity. That part can be automated now. 
So anyone who have a possession of a good enough language model uh, can automate that part uh, that used to take humans, right? So it become kind of part of just press a key uh, and like send phishing emails and so on, except now that phishing email, instead of being a one size fits all, can actually all be spare phishing, which is micro-targeting on micro scale. Um, what are some narratives that they are coordinating mm -hmm. like, that, are, that are common between Russia and China? Is yeah, as I mentioned, uh, it's just to amplify the existing uh, polarization in our society. So it could be mask, anti-mask, vex, anti-mask, vex, uh, or the, the usual suspects. Yeah. When it comes to you know global mm -hmm. security policy, what, mm -hmm. what narratives are they? Mm -hmm. Are they are they um, amplifying there? Mm -hmm. Well, that depends on the, the tension of the day, right? So, um, for example, uh, as I mentioned after uh, US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit, uh, the tension was. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, they washed the Phoenix. We moved them to tears, but yes. maybe not. <laughs> What about, should I put one of these over? There? No, it's fine. No? Okay. <laughs> this is fine. And they also see next to me, so they can get it. Quite fine. That's fine. Those are shoes, yeah. Okay. It's a very Chinese video. Uh, okay. All right. So, okay. So, yes. So, as I, I was saying, um, whenever there is a, a tension, uh, there is a room for polarization. And when the society shows polarization, there's a opportunity to amplify those polarizations. So it changes uh, by the day. Uh, but the strategic goal, of course, is to decimate people's trust in the democratic institution. Uh, and our counter uh, measures uh, evidently worked uh, last August, right? The stock market did not crash. Uh, but um, I think each unsuccessful attempt uh, only make our uh, minds more inoculated so that the next time when they try something like that, it will not, uh, it will have even less effect. Um. So do, during Pelosi's visit, for example, mm -hmm. what 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 were some specific examples mm -hmm. of that? What uh, mm -hmm. messages they were that they were trying to amplify? Mm -hmm. Sure. So as I mentioned, uh, the the hate speech, the hate visualization outside of the Taiwan railway station and so on, uh, is all kind of hinged upon this notion of this uh, visit is a provocation. Uh, for war, right? Uh, and of course, we, we all know that this is a, um, a normal exchange. Uh, it's not like uh, in any of her uh, human rights uh, oriented uh, messages or visits uh, did Speaker Pelosi actually provoked uh, the, the PRC's uh, war. But the PRC needed at the time to justify their military drill. Uh, their missiles uh, and so on, uh, and so they wanted to portray uh, whatever um, the speaker Pelosi uh, said or visited and so on, uh, and trying to portray that into a deliberative provocation, even though that there's no provocation uh, to to speak of. So it, it's quite interesting how they uh, amplify those messages. So have you, uh, as a minister, have you received mm -hmm. more funds, government funds, mm -hmm. to strengthen? Cyber security. Cyber, cyber, yeah, and, and digital resilience. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the model was set up because of the need uh, to have not just the administration for cyber security, but also the National Institute of Cyber Security uh, to provide research and development uh, capabilities uh, for practical cyber security uh, technology that can be uh, used by everyone in four years or less. So really short-term practical uh, R&D. Uh, I'm also the chair of the uh, National Institute of Cyber Security. Um, so um, uh, when it comes to, to you know, just creating cybersecurity, the, uh, on, just on the fundamental issue of internet access, mm -hmm. um, how do you secure uh, mm -hmm. that? In the in the in the scenario of a mm -hmm. natural disaster or or, mm -hmm. a, or an attack, yeah, a really large earthquake, <coughs> which may be natural or unnatural, right? So uh, we work with just like Ukraine, uh, we work with the public cloud providers. Uh, at the moment, um, I believe Google, of course, 
but also uh, Microsoft uh, and uh, Amazon uh, all have the local zones uh, in Taiwan for their computing infrastructure. Uh, this matters because uh, if the submarine cables are disrupted and we still want to video conference with one another, uh, we're both in Taiwan uh, and we want to video conference, but if our computing substrate for our video conference is in Japan or Singapore or somewhere else, it means that we can suddenly cannot connect uh, to each other. So this uh, differs a little bit from this data localization uh, privacy uh, ideas, but rather this is data uh, and computing localization, uh, data flow localization for resilience uh, goals. Uh, and so we ensured that, so that the adversary will have to disrupt all three public cloud providers in order to deny us uh, computation. Uh, we also want to work with a plurality of satellite providers. Uh, we already have some capacity in uh, geosynchronous um, satellite, but also we work with mid and low Earth orbit um, satellite providers so that, again, it will uh, take a disruption of several constellations in order to deny us uh, international communication. Yeah. Could you give just an explanation of Mm -hmm. How how plausible is such a scenario? How mm -hmm. oh, it just ha happened, you know, in Mao yeah. Do you know that incident? Yeah, yeah. So that. so around Mao right? Yeah. So there used to be um, several submarine cables, yeah. uh, two of which are a backup of each other, mm -hmm. but then they were just accidentally uh, destroyed by fishing vessels and cargo vessels flying the PRC flag. Uh, and so they don't have internet anymore uh, to Taiwan. Uh, of course, we immediately set up microwave uh, backup, but it was not uh, the full uh, uh, bandwidth of what people in Mazu needs. Uh, so we allocated more spectrum. Uh, we're, we're doubling essentially the microwave uh, and of course repairing the submarine cable and then uh, next year we'll have another yet another cable. Uh, but uh, already as we talk now, um, there's already uh, mid-Earth orbit satellite receivers um, and being tested around Taiwan and one of which is in Mazu uh, so that they can also video conference uh, with, with us. So um, fiber optics, uh, microwave, and satellites, they form this plurality of uh, backups that we have seen in a kind of microcosm around us right now. So you think that was deliberate? Uh -huh. You think that accident was deliberate? Um, well, it, they, they said quite publicly that it was a mere accident. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, but what we're probably trying to say is that uh, we want to make sure that the microwave and the satellite backup work to such a degree that no matter whether it's accident or not, uh, the people in Mazu's lives will not be severely impacted. But to, to, to take out all of Taiwan's internet access, mm -hmm. I, as, as far as I understand it, talking to, to the cybersecurity experts, there's mm -hmm. at least 15 locations that would have to be targeted simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Does uh, that sound like Well, we had actually an earthquake around 2006 in southern Taiwan that because it's an earthquake, right? It's not targeting any particular uh, fiber optic line. Uh, there's no targeting, I guess, in earthquakes. Uh, but yet, it severely disrupted uh, the communication quality uh, to, to certain data centers. So while, of course, to completely black out Taiwan uh, in the international internet, that may take a lot more work. Uh, but we have already like severe impact in certain regions in Taiwan uh, if a severe earthquake happened that actually happened. Um, so, um, you know, when it comes to building civil defense mm -hmm. capabilities, mm -hmm. um, uh, could you just sort of outline your strategy there mm -hmm. uh, from a digital perspective? Mm -hmm. what, is, what does a digital strong civil defense look mm -hmm. like for Taiwan? Yeah, certainly. So, uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, the journalism I wouldn't say training, journalism habits of mind uh, is the most essential uh, because whether it's propaganda, disinformation, spear phishing, scams, and so on, uh, what they're really doing is they erode the fabric of trust in a democratic society. <clears throat> and to rebuild that trust uh, involves uh, everybody uh, contributing to sense-making. Uh, 
right? So like using um, air pollution uh, sensors um, to uh, measure the actual air quality, adding it to a distributed ledger, sharing with your parents, which is actually what Taiwanese school children do, or fact checking the three presidential candidates as they're having the forum or a debate and see your name appear on it because you catch a presidential candidate saying something counterfactual uh, and, and so on and so forth. So these democratic practices uh, <clears throat> need to start way before they turn 18 and get the right to vote. Uh, because if by the time they get the right to vote, they already suffered six years of no meaningful participation in civic sense making, then they will probably not care much about democracy. Uh, but if during those uh, formative years, they see that they can impact positively um, their community in a way that's democratic, then once they turn 18, they will think uh, democracy is everybody's duty. Uh, this is very important. Um, how, how much do you collaborate and mm -hmm. coordinate these efforts with the education? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Before. So before joining the cabinet, I was actually at the basic education committee, uh, curriculum community. So um, in that curriculum reform, uh, in the 2019 uh, curriculum, um, we did two things. First, we changed media literacy or digital literacy into competence, media competence, uh, digital competence. Literacy is when you consume knowledge, uh, competence when you create uh, knowledge. Uh, and so we... Um, made sure that each uh, high school teacher can actually set up their own uh, classes uh, to con contribute to their local community uh, instead of rote memorization or uh, the things that are uh, probably not going to make any sense now with language models. <laughs> these, these are gone uh, and we replaced that with competence-based education that's first. And the second thing is also we encourage lifelong learning, uh, in what we call uh, intergenerational solidarity. Uh, so, for example, in undergrad level studies, uh, the students are encouraged to work with their community elders, their senior uh, citizens. Uh, maybe they form social enterprises together. Uh, maybe they run a local co-op together and so on. So learn the wisdom from the elderly uh, while helping the existing community to digitally transform themselves uh, so that their culture can reach uh, more people. Uh, it's a kind of equal peer-to-peer -peer, uh, relationship between the two generations. That's also very important. Uh, do you think AI will transform mm -hmm. educational mm -hmm. capabilities in Taiwan? Yeah, if it's assistive intelligence, yes. Uh, if it's authoritarian intelligence, not so much. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, I think language models uh, is uh, particularly useful uh, when you are in one of the minoritized uh, language group or cultural group, because prior to um, contemporary language models, you have to actually speak pretty good English uh, or pretty good Mandarin in order to get uh, the kind of knowledge, uh, especially on the higher uh, degrees and, and levels. But now with language models, anyone with our 20 national languages, uh, including the Taiwanese Sign Language, uh, can uh, have a more equal opportunity uh, to not just learn from existing bodies of work, but also, as I mentioned, contribute uh, their culture, their particular community culture, and include more people in their norms, in their communities. Uh, so it has a very wide equalizing effect. Uh, so this is the first thing. And, and the second thing I believe equally important is that it also works not necessarily in Taiwan, because in Taiwan, broadband is a human right, but also in places less connected to the internet. Right, the other two or three billion people who only have very spotty internet connection. Uh, the large language models, um, I have one uh, in my MacBook, uh, is one of the largest ones um, at 65 billion um, parameters, but when compressed, it's just 70 gigabytes. Right, So I think GPT-4 uh, is just around 10 times more, but still fits in a USB stick. Uh, and so, um, if you can distribute that, it's like the entire internet uh, compressed into a USB stick uh, and uh, you can distribute that uh, to places without internet connectivity and they still have an interactive agent. Uh, you can query the entire internet by just talking to your laptop. Uh, I think this also uh, is very powerful when it comes to education and less well-connected places. What are the risks with this language model? Mm -hmm. Sophistication, increased sophistication of AI. Um. Well, first of all, uh, it enables defects, right? Whatever enables this kind of cultural translation 
can also uh, translate in a malicious way for um, like calm and scan, right? So uh, previously, many communities rely uh, on these cultural behavior cues uh, to tell an insider from an outsider. But now anyone uh, with a language model can portray themselves as an insider. Uh, by speaking very fluent, uh, like local community, uh, even with cultural knowledge. Uh, and so it becomes much easier to mount uh, spear phishing and other uh, calm attacks, uh, as I mentioned, by voice cloning or uh, things like that. So uh, a much uh, higher potential for, for abuse in terms of uh, like faking identities and so on. So that's one. And uh, the second is also because it's uh, possible to translate automatically between computer languages too, uh, and even compiled uh, binary programs. So it means that automated uh, discovery of security vulnerabilities become much easier, uh, and uh, cyber attacks become much easier to mount. You don't need a lot of specialized knowledge in that particular hardware instruction uh, set, but you can still um, do security analysis uh, and find exploits. Of course, it works both on the blue team, the defense side, and the red team. So, um, so it, both sides will be much more automated from this point on. Have you been uh, the victim of or, or mm -hmm. the target of a lot of the fake identity? Uh, well, I, I publicly donate my likeness, my model, right, to the public domain. Uh, I even work with the Board of Science and Technology before the MODA's inauguration uh, to have a deep fake film about myself. Uh, somebody deep faking me, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, I said at the end that that was a deep fake, right? So, so um, to raise awareness. So, uh, I think this is a, a real situation uh, that if people become sufficiently aware, that it is now possible to voice clone to <coughs> video call. Uh, then one will not fall for such traps. So our work, uh, as I mentioned, uh, when I uh, open source right in the public domain, all my models and likeness, this is just to ensure that everybody has the awareness that anyone with a laptop or even with a phone can defake Audrey now. Um, uh, going back to, 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 to you know minority languages and, mm -hmm. and identities, how do you... Um, how do you, you know, sustain and encourage um, um, the diversity of Taiwan and, mm -hmm. and the languages here and the cultures here and the indigenous cultures here? Um, how do you how do you sustain that without encouraging a kind of toxic mm -hmm. nationalism? What do you mean by toxic nationalism? Um, um, a kind of um, you know belief that. Um, being from some place is better than being from another place. Okay, but we have 20 national languages. <laughs> I mean, the, the kind of uh, sentiment you mentioned may be possible if there's only one or two national languages, but with 20, I fail to see <laughs> how that could be, be mounted, right? Because, um, and this is not exclusive, right? Anyone can speak two or three or four languages out of the 20. So this intersectionality uh, is what defines Taiwan. Uh, we're a transcultural uh, republic. Uh, and I think just by making sure that this transculturalism uh, is upheld, uh, by making sure, for example, uh, people who prefer to get public service in their local language can do so, um, I think that will naturally foster this transcultural dialogue. As I mentioned, it becomes very easy for one person who already know two of 20 to learn the third, the fourth. Yeah. Um, so, so how, yeah, how, how would you, you know, if you look at polling in, 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 in Taiwan today, mm -hmm. especially young people are yeah. much more likely to identify as Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. um, how would you define mm -hmm. Taiwanese identity? As I mentioned, it's a transculturalism, right? So uh, it's also a sense of also Taiwanese. Right. We've got a lot of people uh, who may have passports of other countries, uh, but during the three years of pandemic, thanks to the gold card program or some other programs, they spend some time in Taiwan and decide they really like Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan become their second home. Uh, and some of them even naturalized uh, without giving up their original passport. Uh, so this also Taiwanese is 
quite different, right, from the toxic nationalism. <laughs> you just mentioned uh, toxic nationalism would probably require you uh, to, to surrender your passport and sw uh, sw swear new loyalty or things like that. So uh, not to say that it's necessarily toxic to, to do things that way. But anyway, so the, the point I'm making is that um, Taiwanese identity is a recognition of the 20 national languages of the four major political parties and even more people who identify with none of the parties including me <laughs> and, and so on uh, and celebrate uh, this diversity and the collaboration of such diversity um uh sorry So, um, um, uh, how um, you know, do you, your, your office, as I understand it, is run very democratically um, mm -hmm. without you know um, um, too much hier hierarchy. Yeah. Um, yes. How they just call me Audrey. They don't call me minister. No. <laughs> um, how do you make that work? Because there's been so many uh, attempts to do that. Uh, I live in America, and and you know a lot of activist organizations try to do that, and sometimes they it doesn't work. Mm. Um, how? What are what are the kind of what is the recipe for making uh, not necessarily leaderless organization, but mm. less hierarchical uh, organization? Mm. Uh, work. Uh, sharing food and having fun together <laughs> is the key for organization. Uh, I would also say um, like, uh, free of masks uh, really helps. <laughs> right? uh, it's hard to build a rapport like this, enjoying food together when everybody wears a mask. Um, so um, last December, uh, when the pandemic was finally almost over, uh, I said, uh, quite publicly here, uh, that, um, so at a time, masks are required indoors, except if you do your job uh, and the job requires you to speak, like a public speaker or an interview and so on, uh, or singing, uh, and one can take a mask off. So we say <coughs> that, so I said publicly, that in uh, the MODA, the Ministry of Digital Affairs and our administrations, uh, to, to have a meeting is to do a work, do job, that requires speaking, and so masks are become optional uh, from that day, uh, and and so to see each other closely, uh, to build a mental model of each other, including the nonverbal uh, expressions, uh, to really listen. I, I have met now all the uh, staff in Moda and the two administrations. Uh, I cons consult with them. They they sit, uh, I think, in the kind of uh, bulk. It's not balcony. It's the the space uh, that you went outside of the elevator before entering this, right? So that large empty space at the counter, uh, we uh, just sat there. Uh, there's a micro pro uh, projector, uh, and then um, people just ask me questions anonymously on the Slido platform, and I commit myself to answer the ones that are top voted, uh, and then uh, I in turn ask each of the staff a random questions. Um, it's literally random. It's uh, there's a random. Uh, list of questions uh, and then people just shared uh, enjoyed food together and so on so by making sure that the communication infrastructure was in a horizontal way the reporting structure would follow uh, but if you have a reporting structure that's horizontal uh, but there's no uh, communication infrastructure to match uh, including collaborative documents and so on uh, then maybe you'll have structurelessness but maybe it's not democracy maybe it's tyranny yeah. Um, during your time in, in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. what did you what did you take with you uh, as far as lessons? What were what were some things you wanted to bring to Taiwan, and mm -hmm. what were things, some things you wanted to avoid that mm -hmm. Silicon Valley mm -hmm. companies are doing? Right? Sure. Silicon Valley culture. Uh, well, I, I like the move fast uh, part. Uh, but not the break things uh, yeah. part. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can move fast and fix things. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So, so this idea of per permissionless innovation, right? Anyone can innovate in their garage. That, of course, is 
uh, should be celebrated. Uh, on the other hand, this idea of disruptive uh, innovation, meaning uh, that uh, societal institutions, no matter how well designed, uh, should be disrupted. Uh, I find that uh, less convincing. Uh, what we should do instead, uh, to me, is to collaborate with the existing diversity, not to see it as somehow users to be tamed or things like that, but rather to be the humble, uh, to uh, share our designs and let the uh, communities, cultural language communities, to take those designs and run aw away with it, right? To, to make sure that they can fit the technology to their own purposes. Uh, it's called appropriate technology, uh, instead of to somehow, um, you know, toxic, hierarchical um, surveillance capitalism kind of way to get everybody into the same uh, decontextualized platform uh, to, to monetize their attention and so on. So that's the part of Silicon Valley I would rather avoid. Yeah. Um, does you know, working with existing institutions, does that apply to your approach to mm -hmm. media and, mm -hmm. and sustaining a kind of healthy mm -hmm. news environment? Yes, so yes, definitely. So. As I mentioned, news institutions, uh, journalism uh, is really paramount. It is the, the bedrock uh, of democracy. So uh, while respecting existing institutions, we also want to recognize and honor new institutions that enables journalism, right? So uh, cross-source fact-checking like Cofacts or Bellingcat, right, uh, and crowdsourced uh, reporting organizations, uh, Wikipedia, of course, OpenStreetMap, and so on. So they're also doing news-like work, uh, but of course they're not traditional journalistic institutions. Uh, so institutional journalism and civic journalism are both as important as each other when it comes to co-prosperity on the largest uh, platforms, which is why uh, in the digital uh, news, uh, co-prosperity dialogues, which we host along with other ministries like culture and communication and fair trade, uh, we ensure that uh, established institutions and natively digital uh, news workers uh, are both on the table when it comes to such negotiations. Um, uh, is, is there a risk uh, being reliant too much on, you know, you mentioned, uh, speaking of internet access, uh, Google, mm -hmm. Microsoft and Amazon, always has mm -hmm. tremendous power over Mm -hmm. over in internet access here. Is it, is it a risk being reliant on private American companies? But all three will have to uh, to, to break uh, for, for the entire thing to, to break. So there's a strength in plurality, just as, as in satellite. Right? I think SES Global is uh, Luxembourg, uh, French. Uh, 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 SpaceX, of course, is Elon Musk. Uh, OneWeb is uh, UK, uh, British. Uh, and so, on. so, of course, they're uh, theoretically, uh, they're, they're all foreign uh, to some degree, uh, but they also have their own um, priorities, uh, interest, agenda. And so by working with a plurality of vendors, an attacker will have to subvert or destroy all of these different jurisdictions in order to come uh, to deny us communication and that's much harder is your um have your convictions of the value of democracy and, and of journalism mm -hmm. and of an open society um in what way do you think that was shaped by your family background and yeah your my parents, parents were both right? journalists yeah. yeah my dad was uh in Tiananmen uh, until the 1st of June, uh, 1989. Uh, and so that's formative uh, to me, right? Uh, and, and also uh, my own experience in, uh, I am a sec second year of middle school dropout. Right? So I never attended uh, formal education after I was 15. Uh, and so again, I relied on the journalists that share their reports, uh, their investigative reports, on the internet uh, for me to actually learn anything uh, and uh, academics, papers, and so on. So this is the, the common that is uh, the human knowledge uh, that is widely available so that um, someone with my background can nevertheless contribute uh, to the global community. So yes, it is formative. It is difficult for me to think any other way. Yeah. Did, your, did your parents um, give you any words of wisdom or any particular insights about mm -hmm. the value of journalism? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, 
Yeah, I think to, to them, uh, journalism or the pursuit of uh, sense-making, truth, facts, um, is uh, fundamental also to their social work. Uh, <clears throat> my, my mom, uh, for example, uh, was part of the st- uh, founding team uh, of the Homemakers uh, Union, uh, the a co-op structure uh, later on became one of the more important, um, like, uh, feminist slash uh, co-op movement uh, in Taiwan. Uh, my dad is also involved in the community colleges, uh, was head of uh, one of the Wenshan Community College uh, to democratize um, colleges uh, so that anyone who want to pursue higher education uh, can do so regardless of their access to universities uh, and so on. Uh, and I think uh, behind those um, education innovation or um, organization innovation work or environmentalism work uh, is the same core of uh, sense making, of making sure that a society accurately reflects on the challenges, uh, the hopes and fears of today, so that one can take collective action without feeling uh, isolated or lonely or helplessness. Um, in, in the, in the um you know, pursuit of truth and, 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 and uh, sense making. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. How how do you view the um, uh, transitional justice um, mm-hmm. movement in Taiwan and the efforts to, to deal with Taiwan's complicated history? Uh, yeah, I, I think again, as I mentioned, uh, twenty national languages, meaning twenty different histories, mm-hmm. uh, twenty different viewpoints on the same event, uh, and uh, it's not just about translation. It's also about uh, rotation, right? Taking all the sides, uh, being able to be uh, to build empathy with all the different perspectives on the same uh, event, and also scaling. I mean, that instead of just listening to one or two uh, perspectives, listen to um, a lot of more voices, some of which previously denied uh, during the White Terror uh, days. Uh, so yeah, I, I think. Uh, to unmute ourselves, uh, to share the, the rights to, to storytelling, really. Uh, that is uh, at the core of transitional justice uh, to me. And I'm very happy to see many uh, independent game developers, uh, right? Um, animation artists and so on, um, artists in general, uh, to donate uh, their work and time uh, on such an important topic so that we can have a more um, transcultural view of our own history. Um, uh, yeah, I have to ask you, have to ask you about the, also the remote learning uh, oh, yeah. efforts in yes. Ukraine uh, uh-huh. and uh, how that can be applied to here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, Taiwan already have a very strong education technology mm-hmm. community. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we very quickly organized ourselves so that uh, uh, teaching classes online, students learning together, forming workshops, and so on. And a lot of this is hinged on broadband access. Uh, if you have a slow or unreliable internet, it's actually quite difficult. Uh, to get people into the same room, so to speak, uh, and learn from each other. It will be mostly asynchronous, like downloading video and watching them at home and so on. So uh, ensuring that there is plenty of power as in electricity and also plenty of broadband connection like with lowers or with satellites and so on. These are the cornerstones for this kind of co-presence, interoperable co-presence. And now um, I believe with language models, People who want to learn things together can also form learning communities uh, unrelated to their physical distance or uh, time zone or cultural distance. So if somebody in Ukraine or in Lithuania want to learn about transitional justice in Taiwan, (laughs) like this year, it's much easier than the last year or really any time before in history because uh, all of the primary materials can now be translated, uh, even cultural analogies, metaphors translated by language models now. Um, uh, when it comes to, to um, Ukraine's successful um, strategies, if you want to call it that, in mm-hmm. the information warfare, yeah. um, what do you think Taiwan can learn? Uh, not not you know talking about technology mm-hmm. specifically, but more about you know communication. Mm-hmm. Like what are some of the skills that they have mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, given examples of that, that, that can be taught mm-hmm. in, in Taiwan. Oh, yeah. 
So uh, already during the pandemic, uh, we already worked with civic journalists who amplified uh, messages and quelled people's anxiety by reporting closely uh, to what's actually happening on the ground. And so people will always prefer uh, real-time, live-streamed, uh, or at least live uh, reportage over uh, pre-canned propaganda videos. Uh, the problem is, of course, are there a sufficient amount of civic journalists on the ground uh, reporting what's happening? And this is what we see in, in Kiev, uh, in many places in Ukraine. Uh, people take to, um, you know, Signal, Telegram, uh, Instagram, or whatever channels, uh, and just sharing what's actually happening to them. And that's more powerful than anything. Uh, so in Taiwan, we already have a vibrant uh, creator uh, economy. Many people do contribute, for example, uh, in, in counting stations to make sure that the uh, election ballots are counted properly and so on. There's a lot of grassroots participation already for this kind of civic journalism. So uh, I'm quite optimistic uh, when it comes to if there's a large size disaster, people's willingness to share what's actually happening on the ground. I want to give the photographer some time okay. for proper pictures. I can ask just Great. Final, one final question. Um, uh -huh. The election uh, coming up, you know, yeah. what, are the, what are the risks that some of these efforts will be, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, jeopardized if there's, a, mm -hmm. if there's another government? Well, I mean, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's easy now to micro targets uh, with uh, deep fakes. Uh, and uh, interactive ones, so that you can actually talk to it all the time, uh, thinking it's Audrey, but it's actually not, it's a bot. Right? Uh, and so, of course, uh, we're now, uh, I I'm pretty sure you're not a robot <laughs> in this form, <laughs> but across the screen, uh, not, not so likely uh, to be able to tell the difference. So uh, I think that's on top of many people's mind now, this kind of interactive defects that can run uh, without much computation. Uh, in, in fact, my laptop uh, can run such large language models natively without connecting to the internet. Uh, and so uh, the very, very low cost of interactive uh, defects um, poses a threat to commerce, to so social organization, to democracy, and of course to elections too. Uh, so I think that's the upcoming uh, imminent threat that all democracies uh, need to deal with. Great. Thank you so much. Thank really, you. really appreciate uh, your Thank time. You. Really good question. Really, really, yeah. really. Thank you. Thank you.